Hi, I'm Joanna Robinson. Join us every week on the Prestige TV podcast feed as your favorite ringer hosts like Bill Simmons, Van Lathan, Mally Rubin, Sean Fennessy, Chris Ryan, Julia Littman, and many more cover the latest episodes of your favorite TV obsessions. From boardrooms to throne rooms to courtside and through the mushroom apocalypse, we'll be here throughout the week breaking it all down. Subscribe to the Prestige TV podcast feed on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking, or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023, I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago, and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your Life, terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. Welcome back to another episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. My name is Kevin O'Connor, and joining me, as always, is the Ringers' Jay Kyle. Man, what's going on, man? How you doing today? Doing fantastic. How you doing, Kevin? I'm doing pretty good, man. I'm back in LA after uh, uh, being in Denver for a day, and then in New Hampshire for one of my best friend's weddings over the weekend. And uh, here we are. We're one to one in the NBA Finals. Uh, game three will be on Wednesday night uh, when you hear this podcast. And we are only a couple weeks away now from the NBA draft. We're at a point at now, Kyle, where rumors are starting to pick up. We're starting to hear more things about what could happen during the offseason and on draft night. And in recent days, um, there's been some more stuff out there. This more On Tuesday morning, Jake Fisher put out a piece for Yahoo detailing some of the latest stuff that he's hearing. And he said the Hornets at number two. Let's start off here. The second pick, which is really where the draft starts. Fisher reported that the Hornets have some upcoming workouts that are going to pretty much determine what they do here. Amen and Osar Thompson. From the overtime elite are working out in Charlotte on Friday. On Sunday, they're working out Scoot Henderson, point guard from the G League Ignite. And then on Tuesday, next week, they're working out Brandon Miller, the forward out of Alabama. So we're at a point now where Charlotte is going to determine what they want to do at number two, or if they want to be a t- team that ends up trading down for a haul for a team trying to move up there. And seems like everybody, including me, ever since draft lottery night, Kyle, you know, Tate Frazier said to us that he's hearing Brennan Miller was the choice that they were leaning towards over Scoot Henderson. Um, but we're at a point here with these workouts and interviews being with these guys that this is really we're gonna get the, where they're going to figure out what they want to do. Yeah, it seems like at the end of the year, this it's a lot of shakeout just kind of happens in terms of... Um, you know, I think we'll talk more about it that uh, they're like we've we've talked a lot about like the weird year guys in, in the NCAA and just sort of like figuring out. And I think getting people in person can help you, you know, watching someone from afar and listening to interviews is different than having them in the room and like figuring out what happened during the year. And I'm sure the Hornets are in a unique situation, too, because um, I feel like any one of those players that you mentioned is is they all sort of I, I feel like they're just sort of an open book. They they are like um, they are at a, like a crossroads that could go in any direction, like rationally. Like, I think they have a couple guys they could hang on to. But I've heard even people talk about, like, if you get in a really great position, maybe you start to think about like what, what Melo is worth to other people. It just seems like this number two spot is very valuable to them, but it also is there are teams that are closer than them that I think you could kind of squeeze them a little bit and get a little, you know what I mean? Take one step backwards, take a few steps forward, maybe potentially because uh, of how valuable Miller or I think it's mainly Miller and Scoot are the two guys that like you could add those pieces. They're very versatile. They fit with a lot of different teams. And it just seems like there's a lot of leverage there for the Hornets, right? Oh, for sure. No doubt about it. The Hornets at two, the Blazers at three. 
Um, if either of those teams wanted to trade down, like, you know, Fisher, as others have reported, how Orlando with six and 11 and then 36 as well, they're equipped to try to trade up. The Pacers have the seventh pick and then also the 26th, 29th, and 32nd pick in the draft. So they have four top 32 picks and they could be a team that moves up. I think if Orlando were to move up, it would probably be for Scoot Henderson. And if Indiana were to move up, it'd probably be for Brennan Miller because you already have Tyrese Halliburton in Indiana. You drafted Benedict Matherin last year as a guard slash wing type. And then Orlando's got so many front court players already. They just drafted Paolo Bancaro. It would make sense that Scoot would be their target. Do you agree with that assessment if Indiana and or Orlando were to try to move up? Yeah, I was going through and I was looking at like, I, we'll talk about your your draft guide update. I know there was a lot that went on with that and people had subsequent kind of questions about that. And it, it kind of makes sense either way. Like Orlando could straight up address their needs at 6 and 11. Like they could add some perimeter size. They could add some shooting. What they really need are versatile shooters. They don't need just like catch and shoot guys. I really feel like they need players that they can run actions for that will like create gravity. You know, we've seen a lot of the value of that in the playoffs, the maddening gravity of some of these Denver players, the maddening gravity of some of these Miami players. Like at the highest stage, it seems like shooting uphill shooting gravity um, is just so valuable to like supplement what you do. And I think if you're if you're looking at uh, I love the the size and the skill level of the Orlando Magic, like their their three, four, five spots. And I like Fultz as a guy who runs the show, but it does really seem like if they wanted to put it just seems like speed is the thing that would really put their whole experiment into sort of a centrifuge and like make it make it really spin, you know? It seems like the big push on the merry-go-round that would make it work. Scoot does make sense for them. Yeah, I do think so because I think he would slot in kind of right there. I guess the question there would be if they did make that move, what does that say about the other young guys on their roster, especially considering the way the league's going to change in terms of like salaries in the coming years? So with Orlando, you're saying, I mean, I'm, I'm, as you were talking, I was thinking to myself, like, so yes, you agree. Yeah, Scoot, yeah, I do. But Scoot, by, by Scoot everything, you were, could go anywhere. Like, I really do think yeah, so. But, yeah. but well, as you were talking, I was like, huh, maybe Miller does feel more of the, the need for them because that is what they're missing is three-point shooting. You know, they were one of the bottom three-point shooting teams in all of the league last year. They don't really have you know, even the Paolo Bancaro and Franz Wagner types, as much as we like them as young players, you know, Bancaro was one of the league's most efficient, inefficient perimeter shooters. Wagner is a is a good shooter, but not, you know, an elite shooter necessarily. So they could, I mean, if, if they wanted to build this out, let's say Orlando did trade up and get Brandon Miller. Bancaro and Wagner handling some playmaking responsibilities. Miller can do that a bit too. They have Wendell Carter, who is a DHO weapon. Markel Fultz, obviously, in their backcourt right now has been terrific for them as a playmaking type of guard. So there is an argument to be made that it should be Miller. Yeah. Because of everything you're saying. Like that is the most valuable skill. But at the same time, it's about it's kind of, kind of like what you said with Charlotte. You know, there's different types of paths they could go. And like it all makes sense for their roster, partially because of the way LaMelo is built and how he can play different styles. With Orlando, you could see them going different routes too. But I think for Indiana, it makes more sense to trade up than it does for Orlando. Because like you said, at 6 and 11, Orlando can address some of those concerns in both ways. Like you can target a a Cam Whitmore at number 6 or a Grady Dick at number 11. Uh, You could get one of the Thompson twins at number 6 potentially who can be the energizing playmaking presence for you and a versatile defender. I'm I'm a little I feel more strongly than Indiana should move up and try to target Brandon Miller than I do about Orlando. Yeah, Orlando it seems it seems like you would enter like I don't know if you if you thought about running Miller out there and you were like okay we're going to run Fultz, Miller, Franz, Paolo, it makes you wonder how they're going how susceptible they're going to be to like speed, you know, if you think about like the way Miami's been playing like stretching you out and like I kind of wonder if the ball pressure would be good enough mainly because you know, Franz is pretty switchable. Fultz has improved a whole lot as a defender over his up and down career. Miller, I, you'd have a lot of ball handlers out there. I mean, like four ball handlers out there is pretty is pretty fun, and that's kind of the experiment that 
that Indiana is running too. Like if you look at like the most frequent lineup that Indiana ran out there last year was Halliburton, Heald, Andrew Nimhard, and Neesmith and Turner. You got to assume that Matherin is going to be wanting to jockey for that starting lineup this year. He's going to be, you know, trying to be in their in their heaviest lineups. Miller makes sense with them too. I like the idea of that. Um, it, th- those five picks, I mean, they're not going to add five players to this roster. The Pacers aren't going to do that. Now, I, I don't expect they're going to add, especially with Carlisle, I don't think that they're going to want to add five guys on the youth timeline. It, it really does no. seem like some kind of a package, something. And they're like, do you are you surprised at just how close? Because I know we talked a lot about like last year about how the you know the Pacers were just kind of a team that was wandering in the wilderness a little bit. Are you surprised by how quickly they have like moved towards something that like makes sense? Like it seems like they're they're not like outright just terrible. Like they're a team that on any night could be a pain in the ass. Like it does seem like they're close, and I think that would motivate you to move up, don't you think? I would think so. Uh, I mean, I, you look at what Tyrese Halliburton has become and is becoming because he's not done getting better. And you look at the way Miles Turner performed last year, a career best season, and the flashes that Benedict Matherin showed, you know, starting in, coming off the bench, and Andrew Nemhard looking like one of the steals of the draft. I mean, Jalen Smith was solid. Nee Smith had his moments. Brissett, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. deeper off the bench, uh, never mind like a veteran like Buddy Heal. They they just uh, have so much talent across their roster where I do think considering their draft pick situation with four picks in the top 30, 32, this is a class where as we've talked about throughout, there's a lot of talent to be had in the middle of the draft. Um, if you can consolidate those picks in some way, shape or form, whether it's moving up from seven and getting the number two or three or four pick, or whether it's, you know, moving 26, 29, and 32 to move to, like, number 14 or number 12 or whatever it might be to a team that does want multiple picks. I think that makes a heck of a lot of sense. But ultimately, you know, you got all these picks, and that doesn't necessarily mean you can find a match. You know, we talked about Charlotte, how they're in a position to either stay or move down. The Blazers at three, and all all indications seem to be that Shaden Sharp is not a guy they're willing to trade. They want to continue building with him, but the three number three pick could be on the table, either for a trade out or a trade down. And then at number four, the Rockets, you know, everything we've heard in recent months has been James Harden, James Harden, James Harden. Jake Fisher said on Yahoo uh, on Tuesday morning that if they don't get Harden, they're going to target Fred Van Vliet, guard from the Raptors. Uh, he reiterated again that Brooke Lopez is a target, as many people have reported. And he also said Cam Johnson and Dylan Brooks are on their radar as well. So Houston, they're, they have like 60 plus million dollars in cap space. They're going to try to win games next year. With the number four pick, I could see them keeping that and drafting another young guy. But I just feel like all, indica- all indications are this is a team that's ready to just turn around, do an about face and start winning games. And Houston at four seems to be a team that could trade down too, but they don't need more picks. So they're not necessarily a match for an Indiana. They're, they're more a match for a team willing to trade a player rather than a, a haul of picks. That's going to be the interesting thing here in these the weeks to come here. Like, who, who are the actual matches? Because if you're Houston, you're trading out, not down, right? Yeah, I just, I can't really, I can't, there's not a guy there that resonates with me as like a, like a short-term fit. Now, I'm just like, for Houston and, ter- and like, it amuses me that like you're talking about them turning around and winning games. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like, if you're if you're Houston, it makes you wonder if this is like a, a an impatience of ownership because for them to continue building the correct way, I don't think that there is a path for them if they do an about face and try to win immediately that is going to lead to them winning like meaningful games. You know, they might turn around and be better, but are they going to be in the middle? Are they going to be in the lower middle? Where where is that going to take you? Like, because I, I I mean, a Harden, I think it'll take you to the middle, honestly, with the personnel they have. If they add some of the guys that you're talking about. Upper middle, maybe? How far can you even climb if you're doing an about face there based with the young people that they have? I guess it really depends on how much you believe in the in the Tari's and the Shingoons and the Jalen Greens. Um, you know, maybe we differ on that, but I'm I'm pretty skeptical. I don't know. Are you are you with me on that or are you higher? I don't know. I mean, true. I don't know. I truly don't know because we don't know who they. <laughs> you end love up the Rockets like, hey, core, Kevin. You've said it well, a million no, times. No, but I, you know, but I, what I'm saying is we just don't know what they're gonna do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like I like their young core and I wish they would build it out with all these young guys. But 
we don't know if they're going to get James Harden. We don't know if they'd even get Fred Van Vliet. We don't know if they can overpay for Brooke Lopez and steal him away from Milwaukee or if Lopez is going to want to go back to the Bucks on a lower contract to try to run it back. But we don't know any of these things. And that, that's why I have a hard time assessing them right now, even with the number four pick. What could they do with that that might come out and be a big surprise? Uh, is there a player that they could target? I mean, like it, all, it seems like Jalen Brown is going to return to Boston in all likelihood that the Celtics are going to give him that money, five years, super max. But what if Houston calls up and says, hey, we'll give you number four and this and that for Jalen? I mean, like Ime Adoka and Jalen Brown have had a connection. Like, there's just so many possibilities for Houston that could change the way in which we're viewing them. I think in all likelihood, you're right, that they're going to end up being in the middle and they're going to be like right in the play-in bubble and they're going to be in the playoff race and Tillman Fertitta is going to be happy and they're, they're going to be solid. But maybe they could be a lot better than solid considering all the young assets and the draft assets that they have. They could turn it around quickly, but what's available? What's available? I don't know. We don't know yet. Yeah, a lot of missing pieces here. I'm just thinking about like, yeah, Bo- Boston moving. If they did high, heavy hypothetical, if they move Brown, they're just not on the two timeline thing. They just don't have the time or the minutes. Considering, can you imagine this past year if they'd been trying to heavily develop one of these guys that are projected in this like four to even ten range? It's just not gonna. I mean, it's just very, very highly unlikely for like main. I mean, offensively is one thing, but defensively, I think we just see it year after year that like if you can't hold up it's hard to develop you. It's hard to stay out there on the floor. But, and then the Brooke Lopez thing, every time I think about him, I'm just like, Brooke is such a smart guy that I don't think, he doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who would just be like, like he's somebody that's going to do a million things after basketball. Brooke is so bright. He and his brother both are so bright and so just smart. Like, I just have a hard time seeing them pulling the trigger on a situation for just a little more money. Maybe I'm crazy. I don't know his financial What if that's situation. double? Double? What if, they, what, if he, what if Houston offers him like thirty million dollars annually over the next three years, and it's like ninety million over three years, whereas the Bucks offer him like fifteen? Oh, yeah, and then you start thinking about that that state income tax too. That's another factor there. Yep. But I don't, I don't know. <laughs> People always say that, but I'm always like, how much does that really factor in for guys? I, I don't I'd know. love to. Hear what what if he feels like mouth. he can win in Houston? <laughs> what what if like they do get hard and then they do make these trades and and he feels like he can win with the Rockets? I like I, I just I just think that Houston's situation is so fascinating, more than maybe any team in the league right now, considering that they are a crappy team that won twenty two games, but they have a bright future with all their young talent, which was apparent through all the crap this past year. And now they're in a position where they might want to be accelerating things too quickly, which could lead to some of these rash decisions that end up mistakes, or it could lead to one of those great from worst to first turnaround type of things. <laughs> like, it's just, like They happen? are such a weird, weird team to monitor right now. And I just don't know what to expect. I don't either. I don't either. And it makes you wonder, you know, I'm not, uh, not trying to poke the, the Houston fan base here, but like, where would their timeline be if they had taken, you know, like if they had taken Evan Mobley? Like where, you know, it just kind of speaks to what kind of foundation you're building. Uh, I, it, yeah, they they are a huge toss up, a huge mystery. But I don't I don't know. It's it's going to be a long process, I think, any way you slice it for them. Like, I don't think it's going to be a quick turnaround. So on Tuesday, my NBA draft guide updated with a top 58 big board, uh, 18 new profiles in the draft guide after a whole bunch of guys uh, went back to college over this past week. Zach Eady, the top player in college basketball, returned. Coleman Hawkins, you know, we talked about him on a recent episode of Beyond the Arc as a, like a really fun playmaker. Deron Holmes, Terrence Shannon, um, Kalel Ware, who had went back a while back, uh, was joined by some other potential first round picks. Dylan Mitchell, um, who's had a crappy freshman season at Texas. Kyle Filipowski, a couple weeks back, he went back as well. So, I mean, 2024 next year loaded up in kind of that top 20 to 45 to 50 range with a lot of the players who went back, which does weaken that group this year in the draft. But I still think that, you know, top 20 to 50 
range is really strong this year as well, Kyle. Um, and there's some movement in my updated draft guide uh, over on this week on the ringer that you can check out at NBA draft And some of the notable big risers, uh, Derek Lively out of Duke from 20 to 13, Colby Jones, a uh, versatile wing from 29 to 21, Dariq Whitehead, 35 to 27. Um, and then biggest fallers, Ryan Rupert of the NBL from 27 to 37. And then Gigi Jackson, who was previously the number one ranked player in the 2024 class, reclassified into this year's class, went to South Carolina, did not have a great year, um, up and down, a lot of downs, went from 18 to 26 on my board. Uh, of the biggest risers and fallers, Kyle, anybody you know stand out to you? Any questions about stuff that you saw on my board? I guess uh, the Duke guys, just if you could pair them together, you and I talked about this on and off for, for off and on for the whole season. I, I was curious to ask you about like, there's an interesting pattern that I've noticed with like some big guys over the years that like, it seems like double big situations really seem to more often than not go poorly for drafts or for draft prospects in college. Like it just seems like it has a weird effect on how they perform. If you, I mean, not that it affected like their draft spot because Carl Anthony Towns, Aiton and Chet Holmgren all went in the top three, but lively seems and, and Jaron Jackson Jr. Another guy played in a double big situation in Michigan state. It makes me wonder about like lively, um, what specifically motivated you to rise him? Is that more of an intel driven thing or did, you know, this is my sort of standard operating procedure question for you. Was it something you saw or is, do you think it's he came into camp and like was like, hey, I was playing next to Kyle Phil- Filipowski. I was hurt during the year. I had a slow start. I started to come around. What do you think popped that made him rise up your board the way that he did? I think I'm just weighing that end of the season for him a lot more heavily after the way he started so poorly. It was a terrible beginning of the season for him like you said he was hurt he just did not look like an nba quality player i had him at one point ranked 30 on my board and it's been kind of a a steady move up each update as i've kind of you know reevaluated that end of the season rewatch games rewatch clips and i think you see in the league right now you know you see pre-draft workouts with lively he's showing off the corner three something that he at least tried to do in college and we'll see how it translates. But, you know, we were just talking about Brooke Lopez as a target for the Rockets. There's not a lot of bigs that you can say have the ability to block shots and space the floor. So if Lively does become a guy that can shoot at least, I don't know, 34, 35% from three and be the shot blocker, the rim protecting presence with some versatility that we saw at Duke, that's a pretty unique player who can allow you to play a bunch of different schemes, plug him into different roles on offense as a screen and roller or as a spacer. Uh, I, I just think he's a guy who's worth a lottery bet um, over some of the other names. And, you know, granted, granted, like it, we haven't seen him play since March. Uh, it's not like we're new, there's new games, but I do think uh, the needs of teams in the playoffs like having a guy like Lively, if his if he hits his best case scenario, he could be one of the steals of the draft. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think I was also like just reading some of the reports that were coming out of his workouts. I was kind of amused that people were pointing to the fact that uh, he was playing harder in workouts. I was like, that is at the <laughs> that is at the very most for me, like just a minor, minor bullet point. I'm like, oh, what's that you say? He's playing harder now that his like he's being motivated to go make some money. Um, I thought that was pretty <laughs> funny. <laughs> um yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much I would I would go on that, but over the course of the year, I think we just saw like defensively. I think he was a little bit lost, a little bit behind. You know, the injury probably playing a, a factor in that. But overall, that Duke offense just seemed like a lot of parts, and they've had a few teams like this in the past few years. It, like it seemed like a bunch of parts that like could exist. Kentucky had a team like that in 2018 with like Knox and all those guys like they just sort of existed beside each other rather than flowing into each other. And it makes me wonder if maybe he was one of the guys that paid the price for that. Now, granted, he had like opportunity, like he didn't have the opportunity to get a lot of easy shots as a roller. You know, he didn't have a lot of like plays where like Proctor was probably the best passer on that team. Roach is pretty notorious for not being a good C2 passer. It seemed like that probably penalized somebody like him, right? Who's not ready to do self-created offense. He 
depended pretty heavily, I think, on on having the table set for him. And I just don't think that Duke was a team that set the table very well over the course of the year. I'm with you there, Kyle. For the fallers uh, on my list, I mentioned Ryan Rupert, G.G. Jackson. I think with either of those guys, it's, you know, 27 to 37. That's, I mean, they're still in the same lump. G.G. Jackson, 18 to 26. I mentioned in my mock draft that uh, he's been shutting down some workouts. It's unclear if that's because he's been promised. It's unclear if that's because he's struggled or unimpressed in workouts and it's time Does to shut it down a- before he's... Does he need a promise ring, Kevin? Do you think is it is it time for him to get the draft promise ring? We should break it out. I got a good a lot of good feedback about the promise ring. I think I think it should be instituted. Sorry, uh, I, th- I think the promise ring is, is, should be a thing as well. You know, you wear it and nobody knows who it's from. Uh, yeah, I think it'd yeah. be kind of cool. Be it nice could motivate. The, yeah, it could motivate. You know, who knows what kind of leverage plays could come out of that? I'm just saying, like, it just seems it could be it'd be an interesting thing. I interrupted you. Sorry, continue what you're saying. Oh no, no! I mean that—that's all. Uh, I think I think <laughs> that, that's a good—that's a good uh, segue for us into our Q and A portion. You said you've gotten good feedback on the promise ring. We heard from a lot of you. I sent out a tweet about an hour before recording here for some questions for Kyle and I about the NBA draft coming up. Let's start off here with Brett Usher, who asked, "How would you feel about Case and Wallace to the Wizards at eight? And then MVP MV Pascal forty three asked a similar question. Any word on if the Wizards issued Case and Wallace a draft promise? And that's because I assume that question stems from the fact that Case and Wallace had a workout the other day with the Wizards, and then he canceled a workout today with the Hawks. So, I mean, just interesting timing there. Case and Wallace at number eight, Kyle, for Brett and MV Pascal. Uh, what do you think about the fit there for the Wizards at eight? Uh, if I'm, I mean, fit. We do this every year. Fit isn't a word that's like in my mind terribly much because, you know, as we've talked about, if your big three that was all wanting to be maxed is not a not a big three that's going to lead me to a championship, um, I think I would be thinking about just asset acquisition at this point if I, if I'm then. And then also, the, you know, you go the other direction and you're looking at Case and um, I've said it, if you've listened to this show, I've said it over and over again. I think Case and somebody that just sort of interfaces with a lot of different teams like in, in the modern sense. Like he's shown, you know, he's he's fledgling as like a, as a creator. I don't know like how much of a full time creator he's going to be. Like in terms of efficiency, we talked about the rim pressure improving, but the shooting has improved. I think he fits with a lot of different schemes. I think he can play next to a star. There's really not a team out there that unless you just have a crazy glut of guards, and I don't have one on the top of my head here, but it seems to me like Kaysen would fit anywhere. If I if I if I got him and I was the Wizards, I'd be like, yeah, that's a good pick. Like it's not it's not something that polarizes me like the way a Johnny Davis would or or something similar to that. I agree with you for what it's worth. I think he's the type of guy who fits anywhere. And you know, for Brad, whether you keep Bradley Beal or not into the years to come, makes sense for Washington at number eight. CT twenty four asks, do you think the Spurs will move up into the lottery? for a point guard. And the reason why I follow that first question with this one is because I think, you know, they take Victor Wembanyama at number one. That's a given. Uh, we know that's going to happen. They should just announce it all now and get it over with. <laughs> I always think about the Gordon Gunn thing where he, or uh, I guess it was for, uh, Mike Tarico was like, uh, started talking about like, oh, what a cool story with LeBron coming home to Cleveland. And Gordon Gunn was like, uh, we don't know who we're going to pick yet. And he did that like really wild laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, w- I wonder if the Spurs are going to be play coy about it. Be like, no, we don't know yet. No, we're idea. doing our research. Yeah, take the full clock know. at the draft. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> just run the clock down to the final <laughs> second. Yeah, they better not do that. Um, but with the Spurs, it, it is interesting because Wemby at number one, they have Devin Vassell, Keldon Johnson, Jeremy Sohan. Three really good young wing slash forwards. You know, Sohan is the perfect four next to Wemby. And, you know, Devin Vassell is a great shooter off threes, off screens. He can pull up from two. Keldon Johnson, a solid downhill slasher. But they are missing kind of that future point guard. And if I'm the Spurs, like my dream would be, if I were a Spurs fan and I'm like fantasizing about how I want this offseason to go, I'd be dreaming about them trading in for like a Thompson twin to get to like four or five or six or seven to get a Thompson twin to match their crazy versatility and speed on defense, their playmaking ability on the perimeter. 
with Wemby on the interior as a shot blocking presence. I, I just think that combination would be unbelievable. You would cover every square inch of the court with those two guys plus three solid defensive teammates around them and provide a shot making presence alongside Wemby. You could play inverted offense with one of those guys as well. Man, I I, I just I'd love a Thompson twin, but a case in Wallace type. Like that makes sense as well, you know. I, I, man, I, I'd love a Thompson twin with with Wemby. Kevin would like a Thompson twin. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, I wonder if you'd create issues for yourself with Sohan and one of the Thompson twins just because of the the challenges that he has. I mean, he gives you some of that connected playmaking, but the spacing part of it, and also like I don't know. I I, I wonder about them cause, because Wemby's going to be spacing up. I would imagine like the, they would be valuable as cutters, as screeners, like you were saying, like just floating. I wonder what what would you have to even give up to do that though? Like you know, you got to assume like they want to keep Vassell. I would assume. I would assume they're going to want to keep and ho- hold on to Keldon or do maybe they? not. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe Kel- I, Keldon is the guy I would trade. I would want to keep Vassell. I would want to keep Sohan. But I'd be willing to move Keldon Johnson as much as I like him. Uh, I think there's matches in the middle of the lottery to late lottery, whether it's even if it's not the Thompson twins, e- even if it's Case and Wallace, or even if it's like a Keontae George type or a Nick Smith or a Kobe Bufkin, somebody like that. I-, I just think there's a lot of quality fits for their young core to bring that player in year one of Wemby. That's interesting. And what t- what team do you think would pair best? Like I'm I'm looking at like the top, like in the five to ten range. What team for do Keldon? you think for that would be like Keldon looks great here? Like I would like so like, uh, like Keldon plus some type of future picks, you know, for, yeah. to to make it equal value. Dallas at ten, maybe that they would want to move out there. Dallas at ten is the first one that definitely comes to mind. You're trying to get a Thompson though. They're none. We, no, I don't think no, not at ten. No. Well, I'm just saying, like, what's the what's the line, the Mason Dixon line for the Thompson to be in there? I feel like where where do you what do you think the number is where they're both gone? I, for sure, it's probably eight, right? I would assume. I think eight. Eight sounds yeah. about right. Washington. Yeah, would Washington do that to to take Keldon? But the problem with Keldon is a good player, but he's just sort of like well, not just Keldon. Keldon plus future assets picks. But if I'm if I'm the whatever team this is, I'm looking at Wimby and I'm thinking, okay, how quickly is this pick going to be moving into the like 15 and up range? I would think it's going to be pretty fast because Wimby's. But but Kyle, they do have three future picks from the Hawks. So if, if you wanted those picks, you could bet against Atlanta and not take Spurs picks. If you want, if you think Atlanta is going to continue to be this middling team, you could you could bet against them. They might kind of land in the, yeah, those might kind of land in the same spot. But yeah, a team that, Keldon and then the picks, that I was just going to quickly just say that Keldon, I like him and he kind of just checks a lot of boxes, but you wonder like what his plus plus, I mean, you assume defense, could space for you a little bit, handle it a little bit. He's just a role player. He's a, he's a guy that could help a team that's close. Maybe the Magic, but I don't know. I don't know that I would mortgage if I was any of these teams for, for him, especially considering where those picks would be. But it's an interesting question. It is. From jazz jargon on Twitter, what do you make <laughs> of all the Bilal? About? <laughs> well, it's not about the jazz. It's about Maybe Bilal it's just Koulibaly. About, oh, uh, Koulibaly? Yeah, let's do it. Koulibaly, yes. So what do you make of all the hype recently? He says, a couple of weeks ago, he was projected in the 20s, and now I'm seeing hype of him top 10. Is the rise mostly recency bias because he's one of the few prospects still playing? You take this one first. I'm 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 just rapid fire answering these. I know what I think, but I want to hear what you f- think first, Kev. Let me hear it. I mean, maybe it's recency bias. I mean, we all fall into recency bias sometimes. But I think more than anything else, it's, it's that this kid is actually improving. I mean, at the mm-hmm. beginning of the season, he was not even playing alongside Wemby for Mets 92. He was playing in their lower level team. And that, then in then January, he starts getting minutes, and he's showing, oh, three and D qualities after dominating that lower level league. And then over the course of the year, he's like, oh, he's not just, you know, three and D defending well, hitting spot up threes, running the floor on offense. Now in the playoffs, he's getting some opportunities on the ball. He's attacking closeouts more. He's showing some stuff off the dribble. I think it's not recency bias. I think it's just following this guy who has continued to improve over the course of the season and continue to check boxes. And 
like Victor Wembanyama himself tweeted out the other day, people haven't caught on yet that he's actually just not a top 10 talent. He's a top five talent. Oh, uh, that, yeah. might, that might be a <laughs> bit much. But I just found it very interesting Wemby going out there to say that because his rise is happening so much. I wonder if at some point in the coming weeks, it won't be his own teammates saying that, um, but it will be some draft analysts that say Koulibaly is worth that type of pick. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you. I mean, it it does help him. I think it's it's a positive look for him and Wimby that they're still playing. When you look at the people who shut it down, and it, it they they both strike me as like super super competitive players, which I obviously yeah. who who doesn't love that. Um, but you're also correct that like he's just somebody who is very uh, you know the cliche these days is dog in him. But I mean, he's just a uh, He's just kind of a prick guarding the ball, guarding ball screens. Like if you watch him, like he he refuses to be screened. He's got a lot of flexibility. He's bouncy. He's got decent switchable size. And if you can hit open threes, I mean, you know, he attacks the rim like a maniac. And you're looking at the other guys. A good a good kind of question would be: We were talking about risers and fallers. I mean, like like a Jarek Whitehead versus a Kulabali, like. They're pretty evenly, they're almost the exact same age. They're almost the exact same height. They play similar positions. Is it helping Koulibaly that he's playing right now? And is it hurting Whitehead that he had a weird year? Like when you're betting on on this? The one thing about, uh, you know, just quickly, not to dwell on those two beside each other, but like, you know, Whitehead, for instance, shot like, 47.1% uh, from three. Uh, I mean, or we just had, no, 43% from three, 47.1 near the rim. I don't know. Koulibaly, I'm trying to think about like what would reasonably, what would be a good pick. I mean, I feel like somebody might surprise us and take him in that like 10 to 15 range. I could see it happening. The OKC seems to surprise us every single year. How high could you see him going? Definitely 10 to 15 range for sure. Um, I have him currently 15 on on my board. He could very well rise further than that. I mean, he's shooting the heck out of the ball this year for them, man. He's making 40.4% of his catch-and-shoot threes, according to Synergy. I mean, he's, like you said, I think that's a perfect description of him on defense. He's a prick. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, he's a prick. Like He, he had a win. Uh, he had a play on defense and their win to move on to the to the final where it was like, a pick and roll on the right side of the floor with Koulibaly defending the screen and then Victor Wembanyama defending the screener. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll restate that. Uh, Koulibaly was defending the ball handler and Victor Wembanyama was defending the screener. And like he tried to fight over. It was a good, hard screen. And, and then they ended up having to switch. And as the, the big man rolled to the basket, Koulibaly recovered and like he looked like a safety you know, kind of contorting his body midair to deflect the ball away. You know, it was, was a high pass, and he created a transition opportunity. It was just one of those moments where, like, he just doesn't stop fighting. He's just constantly going hard. And, I mean, the offensive development on top of his baseline as a lockdown defender, uh, I mean, it, this dude's awesome. Like, he's just such a good 3 and D plus player. He can do more than just hit threes off the catch and, and defend. He can move without the ball. He's a cutter. Like just like what the, the teams are watching right now: Denver and Miami. Kulabali has the IQ and the skill set to play in either of those offenses. He has the grit and the tenacity to be part of the culture for either of those defenses. Like, what more do you want? Yeah, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, totally. And I'm I'm looking, I don't know, you know, the teams that I think could use him, whether or not they'd take him, whether or not he'd be there. I mean, I definitely could see him working next to Luca. If you look at him like guarding point Ooh. guards, him hitting as a cutter, Luke, he'd just be a fun toy, I think, for oh. we we always talk about players next to playmakers as like toys. He would be a fun instrument for for uh toy. This is I don't know what it is about that word. He'd be a fun instrument of scoring, I think, for Luca. Uh, I think if you look at, he seems Raptors-y also, international player, very athletic, very switchable. I think his shooting upside's pretty pretty good if you look at where he's starting. And then the overlap of like that type of athleticism and that type of shooting, if you look at the way you you described him as like a safety, like he does have that like combination of strength. Like I, I prefer guys with that crazy core strength as opposed to like the wiry people that were like, oh, he's going to fly around and get deflections. Like you want somebody that can stay in front of the in front of drivers w- without fouling guys that can be like not demonstrative with their body, like that they can wall people up. But I was saying that like 
if you can also hit threes, the overlap of that type of athleticism and that frame, it seems like it's a frequent issue that those guys have struggled shooting the ball. But his shooting upside seems pretty solid, doesn't it? Like, it seems like it's unusual for that body type. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, OG and an OB, somebody like, is that like somebody who comes to mind? Of course, he's a talking bigger. About? Um, yeah, he's yeah, I'm stronger. Sure. You know, he is thicker. I'm just, I mean, I'm curious, like, what type of players you're, come to mind for you? I'm just thinking about, like, the super athletes. I've always, I mean, I've compared him to, like, a, an Amon Shumpert type, but he shoots it better than Shumpert did. I mean, Shumpert did coming into the league. Shumpert kind of got there eventually. Like, he was passable, but, and the league's changed since he played. But, um, I don't know, like a Diallo. I'm trying to think of the other guys that are sort of in that that height range with that build, with that athleticism. Might be something I can investigate a little further. I mean, ultimately, though, like that is going to be the question with him is how how real is his shot? He's the season. He's still shot only 61 percent from the free throw line. Granted, his numbers have improved over the course of the season. Uh, last year, he shot 68 uh, percent from the free throw line and only 21 percent from three. So numbers up from three numbers about the same from the free throw line. I think his touch is good enough. Uh, that you can feel confident that he'll at least be a competent shooter, but maybe he's not a 40% catch-and-shoot guy as he has been this year for Mets 92. I like him, though. I, I, tr- I trust his touch overall, and I and I think a lot of teams do, too, and that's why we're seeing this type of rise. Uh, so Koulibaly, we talked about him as somebody that can fit a lot of situations among other prospects. Jazz Focus, at UT Jazz Focus, asked, who is the most situation-reliant prospect? Um, I know all are in some sense, but who's the most? And he lists Anthony Black, Gigi Jackson, um, and he's talking largely about top 15 guys as as situation-dependent players. Is there anybody that comes to mind to you, Kyle, that would be kind of, uh, he'd be bummed out if he were drafted in a certain situation? I mean, Gigi is an interesting one, I think, just because whenever you have talent that is underperformed in the past or like recently, if you have a guy that has que- I've heard a lot of questions about like Gigi's kind of body language at workouts. He's one just because I, I think that he needs to be in a culture that can elevate him, that can protect him as he develops. Like does uh, that kind of seem he seems like one that I think is the case. Um, I think Leonard Miller is another one, I think, that like in the right developmental situation, like if he gets on a team that is close or has something together um, that's working, it could change his timeline. You know, if he gets with a good shooting program, I guess I'm talking more about like the infrastructure that the players are going to. Those are two that pop to mind immediately for me. Uh, Our guy Nick Smith that we've talked about a lot. He's somebody that I think, you know, if he goes to a team where maybe he's liberated in a bad way too early, it could be could be bad for him. I know those are three that just kind of pop to mind off the top of my head. Do Do you have any that that strike you? I mean, the first guys who come to mind for me are some of the shooters, Grady Dick, Jordan Hawkins. Those types of guys or even like a Kobe Bufkin type. I, I just hope they get drafted to a team that's going to put them in motion. Like with Grady Dick, I think back to Kansas at times where he was just kind of stationary in the corner. Like, I mean, the, the, like I just want to see that guy in the move. I want to see him coming through screens. I want to see him cutting. I want to see Kobe Bufkin in a two-man game. Like Bufkin with the heat, him and Bam out of bio playing together, something like that. I, like I'd, be, I'd be excited to see Bufkin with the heat. I would be disappointed to see him land with the Hawks. Oh, yeah. Like, like that, that's, that's like the type of thing that I'm talking about with some of these shooter, shooters or movers without the ball. I just hope they land in the right situation that's going to really emphasize their talents uh, without the ball. Can I hit you with a trivia question really quick about Grady Dick? Just because I want to sure, see if you I, can guess yeah, the answer please. to this. I'm definitely bad. I'm horrible at trivia. <laughs> no, I think you'll get this. No, it's about his performance. I don't think it, I'm, I'm not blindsiding you here. Uh, he he shot 44 transition threes this year. What do you think he shot what his percentage was from three hmm. in transition on 44 on attempts? 44 shots. Yeah. Let's go with, uh, I'm just doing the math. I'm doing the math on a calculator right now. Uh, eight. So 18 would be 40.9%. Let's go with uh, let's go with eighteen. Eighteen. No, Kevin. He shot fifty six point eight percent on transition threes <laughs> this year. <laughs> so you're talking about moving him? I mean, he benefited yeah. from their cumulative team speed. 
In college, it can be tricky. It can just be tricky. You got to have the right personnel to move guys <laughs> consistently like that. But I <laughs> I know, that's a crazy. And he shot 46.7% on above the break threes. This guy can shoot it. I just, I think we could see his life change if he's with the right. <laughs> yeah, I know, man. I know. It's insane. Um, so D- Dick is an interesting one. It, uh, yeah. Dick, Dick could, I'm not going to make that joke. Never mind. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm proud of me. I'm proud of me. I didn't. I didn't do that. All right. Here we, yeah. Dick, Dick in transition, a major threat, uh, and hopefully that movement translates. Um, f- you say fifty six? Unless this is wrong, I mean, I have fifty six point eight on forty four <sighs> attempts. Yeah. So that's that's crazy. That's pretty good. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, this I'm guy pulling moving. up a synergy page as we speak. Man, that's yeah. So there mm-hmm. we go. You know. Any other last minute questions that have come up as we were recording? Uh, There was one that I thought was interesting. I was going to ask you about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. throw it at me. This question is about the Thompson twins, the red capybara (laughs) on Twitter. Um, He asked, why did you mock Amin to Orlando when his brother is higher on your board? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Sometimes with my mock draft, we're not at the point where I'm doing mocks based off of Intel. My big board is different than my mock draft. Like for big sure. board, I'm yeah. I'm ranking guys as as I would rank them in my mock draft. Sometimes I'm trying things out. Like I put Cam Whitmore to Houston at number four. Um and within the blurb I acknowledge that a lot of people select the Thompson twins there, but I wanted to see how it looks with Whitmore going for. Um just like with Orlando, I'm curious to see. Sometimes I like getting feedback from fans uh on what this is like a peek behind the curtains here with the way I do mock drafts. Sometimes I select a player for a team that I don't think is the right pick. Because if I do like my grade A mock every single time, it's going to be the same one every single time. And it's never like that on draft night. Mm. So with Amen going ahead of Asar to Orlando, I'm a little bit interested that within a few hours of it publishing, multiple Magic fans have been like, <laughs> Why would we do this? <laughs> <laughs> Did I ask you one you didn't want to answer? I'm no, sorry. not at all. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk. About. I, I've, I've mentioned this. In Your tweets face before. is making me laugh. <laughs> no, sorry. but it, it, I mean, it is it is interesting though. You know, you got Magic fans like, why would we want Amen Thompson? So I find that interesting because mm-hmm. let's say Amen does slip to six on draft night. Let's just say that happens. Could he be a guy that's a candidate to fall? You, you asked me earlier, Kyle. What's the kind of the floor for Amen and Osar to go? Is it eight? What if it's actually lower? You know, could it actually be lower? Does Indiana take him at seven? Are we sure Washington would at eight? Could it actually be nine, Utah? What happens if they fall to number 10? Could it be a Justice Winslow scenario, like when he slipped in the draft way back when and m- multiple teams were trying to trade up to get him? I don't know. Just sometimes I like throwing things out there in mocks to see like how the board falls in different ways and how that could lead to unique situations. Yeah, I mean, we can sort of, all it takes is for one team to do something we didn't expect and everything, you know, yes. everything goes into flux. And that's what happens. That's why, you know, these teams are going to go into draft night with several, several, several contingency plans for if this happens, if we, you know, they, you know, they don't go in with one plan. Like, and I think that for that, for that reason, that that approach makes sense because um you know it's it's not going to go to the exact sort of consensus script because the consensus is bullshit usually <laughs> so it doesn't you know, exist yeah there's 30 different modes of thinking out there and and a lot of reasons that even go beyond fit you know so it's just kind of the way it goes did you watch the uh any of the apple vision pro stuff yesterday <laughs> no i saw people tweeting about it, it basically looked like ski goggles or like like yeah yeah is that what it was what does oh, it do? <laughs> Pitch it to me, Kevin. I didn't see it. I've been working on it. It's stuff. not ski goggles. <laughs> well, it looked like you kind of fit over. It was like a VR looking oh, yeah. thing, basically. But it looked like a ski mask to me. Not like a thing over your face, but yeah. Yeah, it's an augmented reality headset. Have you ever worn one of those? Like a uh, Oculus or Quest? Anything like that? Just, I mean, briefly. I think I wore one that was like, it was maybe it was even attached to a phone. I can't even remember what it was, but uh, I don't know. Are you are you a VR guy, Kev? I could I could see that. Do you, are you are you no, somebody? I, mean, I could I, see you watching games at home on VR or playing a little Warzone. Like five years ago, the NBA sent out um, 
you know, like the early version of the Oculus out. That was the one where you had to insert your phone in order to get the VR. And like, the, I thought it was terrible. The quality was <laughs> crap. Like, I, I yeah. just was so pixelated. It, it it was not enjoyable at all. You get that motion sickness pretty quickly in there. I, I didn't like it. And then the newer version, the 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 two, I think this one is better. It's definitely a step up, but I've never felt any desire to put it on ever since the first day um, I tried it out. It's just, I just don't like it. It's too pixelated. However, this one, the Apple Vision Pro, you mentioned watching games in VR. That's what I've tried doing. I tried doing it five years ago. I tried doing it earlier this year with the other products. With this one, Ben Thompson, uh, who uh, on Twitter is no tech Ben. He's a huge Bucks fan. And then he runs a massive tech blog, Stratechery. Um, he wrote about the Apple Vision Pro on his page. And he said, for him, he sat courtside at games in the past. And so he knows what that's like. He said, with this headset, there was a short demo showing an NBA game with courtside baseline seats. And he wrote on Stratechery that it felt shockingly close to the real thing. Whoa. And he said he would spend like a thousand dollars or thousands of dollars to get an annual membership to sit courtside at games. And what he wrote on his site was that for him, he said like there's no pixelation issues here with the Apple Vision Pro, which has been the big issue for past that I've had personally with past VR headsets. I've just rather I would rather watch on TV, but with this one, it's he says they solved that issue by creating their own cameras to capture the game. And it's just going to be very, very interesting to see where this tech goes from a, a, a consuming the game standpoint. Because when I first tried it out years ago, I was so excited. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get to see what it feels like to sit courtside. It doesn't feel like it. It sucks. <laughs> I just want to watch League Pass. But the fact Ben, who you know is great at what he does, he's the best doing what he does, um, was so high on this. I'm just I'm very intrigued. I am very, very intrigued by how it could change the way in which you and I are consuming games in the years to come, Kyle. I have a few questions about that, I think, like for for the people making it. One would be it's going to get it's going to start getting interesting to see if some of these companies get like exclusive tracking data rights to like auxiliary cameras that are going to be in the arena because we know Second Spectrum already has them. I'm just kind of curious how that's going to work, like the tracking deals. Also, I would want to one of the big things about sitting courtside isn't just the visual, it's the audio. You know, I would wonder what kind of audio is going to be going on down there. That's the big selling point. You want to hear the play player conversations you want to and those are things that the NBA has kept kept away from the general public mm-hmm. those are the things you got to pay for to get down there so that's something that I'm like I'm a little dubious that they're going to do that I feel like you'll you'll be you'll probably hear the game feed and for for me that that would be the big selling point like I want to hear no, Chris Paul I, yelling at the I don't want to hear the I game wanna, feed no broadcasters no. no no bottom bar with the scoreboard which is what Ben Thompson put in his piece he was like if the league were to ever do this, it needs to be, if you want to see the score, you look up at the scoreboard. Like you don't have it on the bottom of your screen or anything like mm. that. It, like It's going to truly replicate as best possible. Or you possible tap it, with, and it comes up like a HUD. Yeah, you know, something like, like come- that, maybe. Like Maybe you have the option to have the scoreboard on the screen with you, but I, I would much rather have it in a situation where you know, you're looking around and it feels like it, and like you said, they have microphones near the cameras where they're recording to best replicate the experience for people sitting in that area. You hear the swearing, you know, you hear, you hear all the talk and everything like that. I don't know. I'm just very, I look forward to trying it out at some point because uh, like that to me would be a, a game changer in terms of, you know, for all of us who are hardcore basketball fans, um, once this technology becomes cheaper, like thirty four ninety nine dollars um, for the launch product, that's hell. That's a heck of a massive expense. Um, for anybody um yeah but like once that once the product becomes more affordable and like this tech is even higher level like we're just still at just the infancy stages of this um i'm very intrigued by by apple vision pro it's interesting it's interesting i just think uh, i just think sitting like it's kind of like football people always say like yeah you think maybe like standing on the field would be fun but you can't see shit so it's like it's better to kind of be up elevated a little bit so you can see the flow of the game that's why i'm saying maybe you have that Maybe you yeah. have that vert. Maybe you have a seat there where, like, there's the camera that's, you know, in the commissioner's seat, 15 rows back or so, and you get that ideal view. 
Maybe. Maybe, maybe. But I, I'm just saying, I, th- I think it's the big selling point, other than like being like floor level, like I've gotten to do it a couple times. And like, no, I mean, Summer League is like the closest I've ever gotten to sit to like NBA athletes like on a, on a consistent basis. I've never gotten to sit courtside. But the thing that like really jumps out is like the speed of the players. That's pretty impressive. Oh, yeah. But then also in the length, I mean, um, I mean, being in the same room with them, like Charks and I went to like the G League showcase and that was that was really amazing just to see consistently game after game sitting right next to it. Um, but the audio, like I said, that's that's the selling point for me. I generally don't really care about VR. Like, I just don't I don't know. I'm not into like watching things with things over my like, I don't care about 3D. I'm just like, I live in a 3D world. What, the, what do I care? Like, I'm not impressed. Like, okay. Uh, I don't know. I'd, I just, 2D two is good enough for me. I'm not interested in the metaverse. I just don't really care. But th- this idea, I would be willing to try it, like, on that condition, mm-hmm. if they, like, let you have the whole experience. But pretty skeptical that they're going to do that, Kevin. We shall see. It'll be very interesting to see that, uh, what is it, early 2024? This will hit the, probably be more of a niche product, but... If it's good for NBA, it, may, it might lure me in. If if it's good for NBA, that'd be the main thing I use it for. Not for working as much, I don't think, but maybe I would. Maybe I, I would. I could see you doing it. I could see you becoming the the, totally. the, NBA, the foremost VR guy. You like? I uh, love tech. Anyway, <laughs> maybe I'll sit. <laughs> maybe I'll be sitting at games while wearing it. <laughs> see you. <laughs> see that. Oh boy, uh, Kyle. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. By that point, we'll be even further along in the NBA Finals. Uh, I'm sure we'll have many more draft reports and rumors to discuss. Um, But for now, Kyle, this is it today. Have a good rest of your day, man. You too. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Ringers NBA Draft Show. Thank you to Jesse Lopez for producing it. Hope you have a great rest of your day.